Second week of January 2014, we were fighting a wage and hour lawsuit over about 20 staff who were not paid for their 15-minute breaks each day. Had a Medicaid violation, an incorrect billing code was used, and we owed the federal government almost a million dollars back. One of our senior staff had been arrested for a DUI. Unexpected losses were mounting from three recent mergers, and, and things were not going as planned. Learned that one of our closest friends had pancreatic cancer and was dying. Having more problems on the home front with work-life balance have always struggled in this area. My father passed away a few months earlier after battling cancer. My mother is 81 and I'm her only caregiver and I just learned that the woman I hired to take care of her had resigned. I had been in my role at Youth Villages for five or six years. I was 29 or 30 at the time. We had about 30 staff, 40 young people. Our budget had grown to almost a million dollars. I remember feeling ill-equipped during that period. I was trained as a counselor and a social worker. I took one business class in undergraduate school and hated it and said I would never enter that building again. Um, being president of my fraternity was the only real responsibility I'd ever had. So I started reading, reading everything I could find, hanging out in bookstores, looking for one simple explanation of what my role was as CEO of this small organization. And finally one day I found it. I came across a book called The CEO Paradox. There it was, six simple words. The primary responsibility of the CEO is prepare its organization for the future. You know, that sounds simple, but it's very difficult to achieve. I had never spent much time even thinking about the future. Most of my day-to-day -day work was devoted to just surviving, getting through the day, and making the payroll on Fridays. Most companies aren't built to last. Often their futures are short. TWA, Enron, Arthur Anderson, General Foods. I hear Bitcoin had a rough day yesterday. What I didn't know at the time, but that my fraternity was a laboratory of sorts, helping to prepare me for my future. Today, my life consists of trying to run an organization helping more than 26,000 troubled young people and their families each year, with 3,000 staff while managing a budget of more than $250 million. Trying is the right word. I'm still learning and learn something new every day. Traveling 74 locations in 14 states, spending way too much time in airplanes and airports. My days consist of strategic planning, board and committee meetings, budget planning and forecasting, managing crisis, working with the legislature in Nashville and in Washington and other states across the country to try to shape policy to improve services for young people, raising money for foundations from some of our country's wealthiest philanthropists, negotiating contracts with more government officials, working with architects and contractors, building new facilities and renovating old ones and the unfortunate responsibility of dealing with legal challenges and problems, the, the ugly part of running a large organization. Manage a leadership team while developing new leaders. And quietly, thinking of succession planning, preparing for organization's future when one day there will be a new leader. My opening remarks were from notes in January of 2014 about a rough patch. During, special, uh, during especially difficult times, I write down a lot. I take notes of what my problems are and how I'm going to overcome them. And sometimes it's not always just to solve the problem, just writing in ways to better understand it to get through the difficult time. We overcame most of the challenges during that period and survived the rest. Got my mom in a great assisted living facility and she's doing wonderful and she'll be 85 in June. But I also made a list of good things that are happening as well. During that same period, we were approached by a group of some of this country's wealthiest philanthropists wanting to give us $200 million to expand one of our programs. And that program expansion is now underway. We also received new contracts that year to expand service in North Carolina, Oklahoma, and Massachusetts. And fortunately, our financial position from the three mergers greatly improved. My family, my faith, my friends, and my fraternity have prepared me best. Take advantage of this opportunity Many of your relationships with your brothers today will be lifelong relationships that will have a significant impact on your future. Here are a few things that helped me along the way. Take care of yourself. I've been a lifelong runner and triathlete. Unfortunately, a few years ago, I started having calf problems and couldn't run anymore. So I'm still an avid cyclist and swim about four or five miles every week. Find a job you love to do. If you aren't waking up and excited about going to work or going to class, if you're in your major, Change your job or get a new major. 
Do something you're passionate about. Every leader I talk to that's successful says the number one reason they're successful is because they're doing something they love every day. And it's a primary, it's a primary indicator of success and happiness. Surround yourself with optimistic and happy people. Think about helping others more than just about helping yourself. Get to know your fraternity brothers, not the ones you're closest to, but the ones you're not closest to. There will always be people in life that you'll have to come to know and work with that you may not be comfortable with. Remember, it's your laboratory. In life, there will always be these challenges. Create good study habits. You'll need them especially when you start in the world of work. Find more big brothers like my big brother, Jim Lester. Life will throw you curveballs, and sometimes it'll throw you a 100 mile an hour fastball and hit you right in the face. And I've had a couple in my life. Learn to handle problems in crisis and build a team of support in your profession and in your home. Read and study and never stop, not just about your profession, but about improving your life. Our leadership team went through an exercise 25 years ago, creating a mission statement for our organization. And as part of that process, we created a mission statement for ourselves. And after a couple days, I began writing mine. And the, and the first sentence was, live every day as if it's my last, with a skip in my step, a smile, in my, a smile on my face, and love in my heart. The driving philosophy that guides our organization is called RE-ED. It stands for the re-education of mostly disturbed young people. Uh, there are 12 principles. A guy named Nick Hobbs, Dr. Nick Hobbs, developed this model with a team of researchers in the 60s at Peabody Vanderbilt, just north of here. And there's 12 principles, and the last principle is my favorite. And the last principle says, in each day, a child should experience joy and look forward to a joyous event for tomorrow. Plan something fun in your day every day. Plan something fun in your Plan something fun in your week, every week and every month. Plan a couple vacations throughout the year. Enjoy life. Years ago, I read a study that was done where a group of researchers interviewed el elderly people in nursing homes, several hundred elderly people, and they asked them one primary question. If you were to live your life over, how would you live it differently? There were three consistent responses. And the first, I would take more time to smell the roses. Well, I don't know if y'all are called millennials, but the millennials that I have that work for us we don't need to tell them that. They're good with that. <laughs> Me, not so much. Second, take more risks. Leave a bad job. Start a company. Learn something new. I read a great quote years ago that kind of reflected a little about who I was when I was 24 years old starting youth villages. It's, I'm not young enough to know everything anymore. It's okay that you don't know, it, know everything. You never will. Take some risks now. Don't wait till you're older. And the third, perform acts of kindness that will benefit others long after you have, you have passed. Three years ago, I got a call from a woman named Rebecca, and she said, she said, Pat, this is Rebecca, and uh, I'm calling on behalf of Stephen Tyler. He would like to meet with you. I said, Stephen Tyler, the lead singer of Aerosmith, and American Idol judge? She said, yes, that's him. I said, why? She said, he wants to learn more about your work. <clears throat> I said, all right. So uh, two months later, we met. In a, in a hotel in the lobby in Massachusetts. And uh, he, he began telling me first, he said, I re I've read everything about you and your organization. And I'm on, I want to uh, become a part of it. I said, what do you mean? He said, let me tell you about myself first. For two hours, he shared with me his entire life history, where he grew up, his drug and alcohol problems, wife problems, girlfriend problems, uh, band problems, uh, financial problems, manager problems. He'd been in rehab six times. He was sober at the time and doing well. Um, but um, he said at the end, he said, then he told me he'd written a song called Janie's Got a Gun 26 years ago. And he said, you know, after I wrote that song, I had more than a thousand cards and letters from women and girls that had been abused, many, many horribly abused. And I've always wanted to do something for them and try to prevent this abuse from occurring for others. He said, will you adopt me and let me help you? Together, we created Janie's Fund to support abused girls at youth villages. He's met dozens of our girls across the country before his concerts, counseled with them, shared his personal story as well. He's also held fundraising events and, and concerts also and raised more than $4.5 million for us. Stephen will be 70 years old in March. But don't wait till you're almost 70 years old to do something meaningful in your life. Uh, go out there, brothers. Make a difference. Change the world. Make it better for all of us. Thank you.